This is the Doubles Only Tennis Podcast, where you learn the best tips and strategies in the world to help you become a smarter, more effective tennis player. You'll hear interviews with pro tour doubles players and coaches, including easy to use lessons to improve your game and win more matches. My name is Will Bocek, founder of the Tennis Tribe, doubles strategy coach, and host of the show. In today's show, I talk with top 20 WTA doubles player, Nicole Melikar. Nicole was the 2018 Wimbledon Mixed Doubles Champion, and she made the finals in the women's doubles draw that same year. She also recently made the finals of the 2020 U.S. Open. This conversation was back in June. It was in the middle of the pandemic, so we do talk a lot about the shutdown and what she was doing with her time off. So if you'd like, you can skip ahead to about minute 10 or 12, and that's where we start with how she got into tennis and how she transitioned to doubles. And then after that, we talk a lot about double strategy. So we talk about her biggest strengths and weaknesses as a doubles player. We talk a lot about serve strategy and using different serving formations. Uh, We talk about pre-match routines. We talk about Nicole's favorite doubles drill. Uh, what a typical practice looks like for her. Uh, And then at the end, we get into some of her favorites, uh, including her favorite tennis book, non-tennis book, uh, and then a funny story as well that she will share. So uh, without further ado, enjoy this episode with Nicole Melikar. Today we have Nicole uh, Melikar on. Um, Am I pronouncing that right? Is it Melikar? Yes, you are. (laughs) Okay, perfect. Um, she is the uh, number 19 doubles player in the world right now, and uh, she won the uh, Aust- or I'm sorry, you won Wimbledon mixed doubles in 2018, Correct. Uh, as yeah. well as made the finals that year. Um, you've got one mm-hmm. title this year so far. Um, Nicole, welcome. How's it going? Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's going good. It was uh, it was a hot day at practice today, so I'm happy to be sitting in the AC. Okay, nice. <laughs> so you just got off the courts. Uh, I practiced this morning. I finished around, I finished like three hours ago. So cool. But still the heat tends to stay with you. Yeah. Where are you? I'm in Florida. Okay. And mm-hmm. who, who are you practicing with? Are you practicing with some other pl- tour players or? Yeah, actually uh, today I practiced with Sabine Lisicki. Um, okay. So yeah, uh, I live in Bradenton. She does as well. And then um, we practiced with my coach down in Sarasota. Uh, my t- coach, Torsten Peschke, who's the husband of Kveta Peschke, my, um, my former doubles partner. So yeah, we, we had a practice together, so it was good. Nice. Awesome. Um, so s- since uh, everything kind of shut down, have you been able to play a lot? What, what have you been up to? Well, during quarantine when nothing was allowed I was fortunate enough that um, the courts in um, I live in a gated community so the courts Mm -hmm. in here were accessible to me so I was practicing maybe every two three four days just depending on um, how I was feeling but Mm -hmm. I was working out almost every day I was uh, I was working hard to try and stay fit and and do other things so I I did like rollerblading biking swimming you know, yoga, Pilates, meditation, just like different things that I could do, especially with a lot of the online stream videos that I could uh, get access to. Nice. Cool. So some of those, like, uh, like I I saw my sister actually sent me this like online boxing video type thing, like something like that. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, I was doing some of the fitness workouts in the Nike app, um, but then oh, okay. the, the WTA was sending us um, some meditation videos and, and stuff like that. So I was trying to get those done. Nice. Awesome. Um, so what, uh, as best as you can tell us, what does what your schedule look like for the rest of the year, um, assuming we That's- have the U.S. <laughs> Open and... Well, assuming everything happens, I will be arriving at the Greenbrier Resort in West Virginia on July 10th to play World Team Tennis. Um, And that starts on July 12th and goes for three weeks. And then um, I'll... I'm assuming I'll probably head home after that for for a week or two and then head up to New York for um, Cincinnati in New York and then U.S. Open in New York. Right. Um, and then after that, yeah, the schedule goes to Europe. It's, uh, I think Madrid, Rome, and then, um, French open. And then after that it extends and goes into Asia. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know exactly what weeks are everything is happening, but it, sure. I mean, based on the schedule right now, if everything goes as planned, that's, that's what I would, um, do, but obviously I would try not to play every week. I would need some time off in between, but, um, yeah, right. we've had a lot of time off now, so I would try and yeah. see what I could do to play. Right. So, so what's, what's your feeling and what's like the talk around the players right now? Um, I see like the media and a lot of the fans saying like, you know, some people are like, Oh yeah, we need to have the U S open. It's going to happen. And then other people are like, there's no way we're going to have it. We should back out after this whole thing went down with Djokovic's tour and stuff like that. What's, what's your feeling? What's, what's the vibe? Mm, I mean, my personal feeling, well, I just read in the news, uh, that New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut are doing mandatory quarantine orders for the states that have had spikes in the coronavirus, which Florida Mm -hmm. would be one of those states. So if I were to try to go up there, I would need to, you know, stay in a house alone for two weeks, basically. Right. Um, So I don't know how that's going to have an effect on U.S. Open. And I know some of the players that are traveling here for World Team Tennis need to quarantine themselves for two weeks. And I don't exactly know how the government you know, checks up on everyone, but surely they're tracking us through our phones and everything. Like they, there's gotta be a way that they're paying attention. Um, mm-hmm. But honestly, if they think it's, if they think it's safe and they're doing the protocols, I think it's going to be a pain in the butt, you know, to get fever tested every day. And the uh, every other day, you know, the swab to get tested to if you have coronavirus or not with the social distancing and the masks. I mean, mm-hmm. it's nothing that we're used to. It's not normal. It's kind of the new norm during this time. And it's super annoying. And all of us hate it. But I guess that's kind of what we need to do. And do I think right. the US Open should happen? I... I I think they should try and make it happen if they think it's safe enough. But my main concern is I don't agree with the fact that they're not doing full draw sizes like a classic Grand Slam. Mm -hmm. And that's the part I agree with. I disagree with. I feel like they need to um, either have all the draw sizes, you know, main draw, qualies, doubles, mixed doubles, wheelchairs, uh, juniors, Mm -hmm. legends, um, you know, do everything, do it right. or maybe they need to do it like smaller and then just not give points, you know, okay, do it for prize money, but don't give points because if they're going to mm-hmm. give points, I think it's going to be unfair. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't know all the details of like what went into that decision. I mean, I guess obviously um, most of the prize money goes to the singles players and then singles gets more, you know, media coverage and TV and stuff like that. So um I imagine a lot of it's just like a, a money thing and, you know, ESPN is involved and stuff like that. But um, yeah, it, it was kind of strange to see. Um, I guess I get that they may, might need to like remove some stuff, but they do a full singles draw and then cut the double draw in half. And I don't know, it's just weird, like how they decided some of this stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, what's also concerning me is at first they said everyone um, is only allowed plus one person because they need to limit Mm -hmm. the number of people. And um, but now I've heard and I don't know if it's true or not. I've only heard rumors and um, that they're going to be allowing players to have like two or three people come. So it's like, well, if you're allowed allowing two or three people to come with the players, then how come you can't have qualies? I'm sure a lot of the qualies uh, players or the doubles players, you know, if you make a bigger doubles draw would be happy to even come alone. But then now um, players that, you know, get into the event can have two or three people coming with them. I, yeah. If that's true, then I don't understand the thought process behind that either because the whole thought process was, okay, we need to limit numbers. Let's only do singles, right? main draw, doubles, small draw, and everyone one person, that's it. But now if they're easing yeah. up on those rules but not opening the other draws, I just I don't understand it. Right. Yeah, if, if they can – get more people in they need to prioritize getting more of the the players in like the people who are actually uh playing in the tournament um so so the doubles draw is 32 right 32 teams uh to my knowledge yes okay that's right and then you're since you're 19 in the world you you should qualify right yes i i will get in Mm -hmm. okay got it um and then 
let's see. Uh, walk us through kind of the year uh, up to this point. Um, you uh, had a good start to the year. You won a tournament in Australia, had the Australian Open, um, and then all of a sudden this hit. So walk us through kind of the, the year so far. Yeah, I mean, I went to Australia early just to, you know, practice there a bit um, with my team and my new doubles partner and uh, just to try and get acclimatized because, you know, the weather is different with the time difference and everything. Sometimes it takes a while, but um, had a good start in winning Adelaide, then went to the um, Australian Open. That didn't turn out to be a good tournament for me, but, you know, that happens. And then um, went home for a couple weeks, and then I flew to the Middle East to play in Doha and Dubai. And that's sort of when um, things started. Uh, the cases in China really um, were going up in the news, and people started freaking out. And that's when at the airports you noticed a lot more people with masks and um, people right. doing um, fever checks especially if you looked like you were Asian um, and it didn't matter if you're traveling from China or not like if you looked right. like you were Asian they were taking people to get checked and then all of a sudden one country I believe it was Kuwait closed its borders for anyone with a Chinese passport so you couldn't even transit through there so when I flew from Doha to Dubai uh, my doubles partner she had to make sure to fly through Oman and not through Kuwait because they wouldn't let her through so then you oh, kind of wow. see it starting to get a bit more serious and then um, then after yeah you get to Indian Wells and my dad was supposed to fly in the day after me or mm. two days excuse me two days after me I flew in on a Saturday and then the next day on Sunday is when we got the announcement that the tournament wasn't starting on the Monday. Right. <laughs> um, and I canceled my dad's flight, obviously, because it would be pointless to go out there. And I booked the first flight I could to fly home the next day. But um, none of us, then the rumors sort of started like, oh, well, we're still trying to get Miami to happen. So I wanted to be in Florida, at least um, I'm in Bradenton, which is about three hours from Miami. Mm -hmm. And so I came in here to practice. And um, uh, a lot of players, I think, came to Florida because there's a lot of places in Florida to practice. And then they canceled Miami. And that's when everyone started, yeah. you know, the Asian players went home, the European players went home. That's when everyone was like, OK. And then, boom, lockdown starts yeah. for New York and and the states where the cases started going up. And that's that's when the madness kind of happened. And then, yeah. Yeah, yeah I remember when uh, they canceled um, – Indian Wells, and it seems like it was like two years ago now. It's crazy. <laughs> um, so I want to pivot a little bit. So, so tell us, uh, tell us your kind of story, like growing up, how you got into tennis, um, how you chose doubles at some point. I imagine you played mostly singles growing up, just like everybody else. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, just just give us uh, kind of your background. Yeah, well, I've always been around tennis. Um, my sister is five years older than me, and she uh, she started playing from a young age. So even when she was five, six years old, um, already playing, I was on a tennis court, running around, you know, picking mm -hmm. up balls and stuff, and just like a like a little one, two year old little toddler. Mm -hmm. um, so growing up, I saw her playing, and I always wanted to be better than um, than her. That was you know the <laughs> first incentive, and then. I beat her when I was 11 years old. And then after I beat her, I started kind of, I, I always had a competitive nature. And that's kind of when I decided that um, I wanted to really try and become a good player. And um, I begged my parents to let me homeschool. And after, you know, several months of, of me really pushing them to have me do that, then they agreed. And I also had another friend that was homeschooling that also played tennis. So her parents kind of helped push my parents as well. Yeah. And then it slowly, then it transitioned into where the small town I lived in in Florida didn't have that many players and the academies around were very expensive. So I got a scholarship uh, to go to an, a John Newcomb's in Texas, the tennis academy oh, yeah. there. Okay. So I spent three years there. And then I went to um, a former coach that I used to work with before in back in Florida, Nick Blackwood. He started an academy in Arizona. So then I went with uh, to work with Nick Blackwood in Arizona. And then from there, I actually got sick. I got um, mono, mononucleosis. So mm -hmm. I, I went home. Um, I left the academy there and I went home to recover. And it took me several months. But um, 
But after that, after I recovered, I actually won the U.S. Open playoffs in mixed doubles. Um, so I had like a little taste of, you know, playing at the top level, winning a wild card into the U.S. Open in mixed doubles. And um, after that, even I, though I had recovered from mono, I still wasn't actually fully fit. So even though I was trying to play singles, I was losing a lot of matches, especially in three sets, just because I, I was too tired to... Yeah. Um, like I'd win a good first set and then I would end up losing because I, right. I had no energy. So my confidence went down and everything. And, but in doubles, I didn't need as much, um, you know, uh, as much of the physical stamina. And I think right. always my game because of my serve and I felt, feel I have good volleys and stuff that like my game was, um, pretty good for doubles. And then my doubles ranking went up, my singles ranking didn't. And then that's kind of when the transition happened that I started getting into bigger tournaments and doubles making more money as opposed to singles. And mm -hmm. um, that's sort of how it escalated. And now I'm a double specialist that likes to play singles and I try and play when I can, but yeah. I don't have many holes in the calendar where I can go for a singles tournament. Right. Right. So, um, so you don't, play, you don't enter a lot of singles roles anymore. Well, I, I try and, um, I enter all the ones that I can every WTA I enter, but the thing is because mm -hmm. my single ranking is low, I don't, um, I don't get accepted into a lot of the draws cause my ranking isn't high enough. And yeah. in order for me to play a singles tournament, I'd have to go to a lower level event. And I'll, most weeks I'm going to choose to play the doubles event instead of going to a smaller tournament to play singles. Oh, I see. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then you mentioned the John Newcomb Academy. I think that's near, I live in Austin. It's Isn't in New that, Braunfels. Yeah. Yeah. So that's like just South of here. Um, mm -hmm. okay. I still, I've lived in Austin for like five years now and I still have not played tennis there. Um, oh really? It's a yeah. beautiful place. Yeah. I hear that. I go to San Antonio a lot and play tennis all over Austin and yeah, I still have not been there, but I've heard, yeah, I've heard really good things about it. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So uh, at what point, um, so when did this transition happen from singles to doubles? Like you're starting to do better in these doubles draws and, um, well, um, I, I got mono in 2012 and then 2013, okay. I was still, you know, I was still trying to play singles, but 2014 is the year where I, you know, started choosing to go for yeah. higher level events in doubles because I could get in as opposed to singles. And then from some like 2014 was, I guess the transition year where, yeah. um, it was basically follow the money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I remember I had mono and back in college, uh, it's and I was like college tennis and yeah, I, like <laughs> I would go to practice and sometimes my energy would be fine for 30 minutes and then just out of nowhere, just, I can't even like toss the ball for my serve. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. It's um, the weirdest disease. Yeah, it is. It definitely is. So, uh, so let's talk about strategy a little bit. So what's, um, what's your biggest strength as a doubles player? Do you think? Um, I'd say my serve. I think um, I think I serve well, and I set up my partners at the net um, to put away a lot of volleys. So I think definitely my serve has been my biggest strength overall. Okay, and what? How do you use that? Like, what are your what are your kind of preferences as far as serves? Do you like to go like T or wide or body? Um, I think a big tool that I have is that I I like to mix it up. Uh -huh. So. Um, so the the element of surprise i think uh, works well along with um the fact that i can create quite a quite a big first serve um mm -hmm. if i want to and if i'm hitting my spots it's great but if i'm not hitting my spots i still feel like i can put in enough variety um with moving it around the box and you know using the kick using the slice but also mm -hmm. using my partner as a as a tool and as a weapon you know when my partner knows um, you know, I'm going to jam them on the backhand body, then I, I know I need to hit my serve there because if it goes forehand body, then all of a sudden, you know, the options are different. So I really try right. and be very specific with where I want to serve and it doesn't work out every time, but I right. feel confident that if I do hit my spot and my partner knows about it, that they can, um, they're hopefully likely to get a first volley. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Now, how do you, how do you think about like going into a match? How do you think about your serve strategy? Do you and your partner talk about like, okay, like, uh, I generally like to serve backhand. So we're going to start there and then adjust in the match. Or do you know, like, do you look at your opponent and say like, okay, like this girl's got a weaker forehand. So we're going to go wide or. Um, I think, I think you, I mean, obviously I have, uh, I have my favorite serves that I like to hit, but Mm -hmm. if the opponent has a clear weakness, you know, if they really don't like the, the kick to the backhand because it gets above their, their shoulders, then, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and work that a lot. Um, and my partner, you know, once I toss the ball up, then my opponent can move as they want. So I need my partners to tell me like, Hey, you know, after you toss the ball up, they're kind of cheating over. So maybe they're expecting it. So maybe you need to change it up a bit. So I'm, I'm working with that feedback from my partner. Um, and you know, he, if I'm playing against someone that returns really well, then I need to definitely be smart about my positioning and my placement uh, like my court positioning where I position myself on the baseline where my partner is the net and also where I want to mm-hmm. serve to. And um, I, you're trying to think about what is the most difficult um, ball for them to hit. So it goes past because ultimately you want to hit the ball as a returner past the net person. Like if the net right. person hits a volley, you know, you're usually afraid of that. So how, which serve can I hit so that there's a good chance that the ball will be in my partner's reach. Right. And so those are, those are things that my partner and I discuss and we try and execute that. But then obviously you need to adjust in the match because um, every opponent or at least at the pro level, they're going to adjust and adapt. So you need to, you need to just keep working with your partner and see what sure. the best solution is. Sure. Do you serve in volley? Sometimes. Um, I feel like I should do it more. Mm-hmm. I, um, the last years I haven't done it a lot, but I, in the, um, the last, uh, this year and last year I, I started doing it more and that's something that I've been trying to implement into my game to yeah. use because, um, I, I think I have a very strong position at the net and if I hit a good first serve or even a good second serve, I think it's, um, it's an invitation for me to go to the net and already have my positioning there. Right. Yeah, I'm the same way. I, I I feel like I should do it more than I do. And mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of and matches sometimes... I'll tell my doubles partner, like, hey, if I don't serve in volley, like, yell at me because I yeah. need to do that. <laughs> like, like, get on yeah. to me about that. Mm-hmm. It's good when your partner can encourage you, like, hey, you're serving so well. Like, get up here. Come next to yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it also can put a lot of pressure on the returner, right? If they mm-hmm. – um, you mentioned serving and volleying on second serves, right? And if you can hit like a, a kick serve where you have a little more time to come in, mm-hmm. uh, the returner might also see you coming in and they you know, go for a little more, or try to kind of dip it a little bit lower at your feet and they, they make a few more errors there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, do you use uh, different formations with your partners, like I formation or Aussie or anything like that? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I feel like, Um, in my career, I've actually used them all. I've, um, I like to play regular eye formation, you know, making sure that, um, trying to, um, so the returner doesn't know if the net person's going right or left. I'll do Mm -hmm. Aussie formation where, you know, you're basically on the same side, your net person is on the same side that you're serving on. And I've even done like both of us at the baseline. If someone is returning just too well and, or, you know, if my partner isn't having a good day at the net and she's just not seeing it, then mm-hmm. I'm not afraid to pull my partner back to the baseline or same thing with my partner if they want me at the baseline. Sure. And then, you know, you work, you work your way around it. And I think that's the beauty of doubles because in doubles, yeah. there's not one strategy that, no, this is how you have to play. You can use right. the whole court. If you like, look at Jamie Murray. He basic, I think he has one of the worst forehands I've ever seen, but because he chips <laughs> it and he gets into the net, like how many Doesn't actual matter. forehands yeah. does he have to hit? And he's been number one in the world and won so many grand slams. It just goes to show you can work doubles to your strengths. You don't have to expose your weakness. Right. What what, what are your favorite times? Like, uh, how do you decide like when to use I formation or Australia? And like, what are your favorite times to to use those? I mean, when it's working, then it's good to keep doing it. I mean, obviously, you don't want to get predictable. 
But um, I think uh, I think if you're struggling, if you're doing regular formation and, you know, players are returning well and you're struggling to win points, I think it's good to mix it up. Mm-hmm. Or vice versa, you know, you're doing a lot of eye formation, but you're not winning many points, then maybe you're overcomplicating it and you need to go more simple. So... Um, and I think also if you see a common pattern, like, Hey, I serve wide and every time, you know, they're a little late and they tend to hit it down the line, then instead of doing the eye formation to make your partner like have to dive for the ball, cause it's so far away yeah. from them, just let your partner stand there and, you know, hopefully your serve is still as effective and the ball will go right at them. So I think, right. I think you just need to adjust based on what you're seeing in the game. Okay. Yeah. Do, do you have a preference on like deuce or add court for using these formations or? Not really. Um, yeah. I do like to use my forehand more cause it's, um, it's a, right. it's, I feel like I can do more damage with it, but mm. if I'm on the deuce side, I have my forehand already there, but if I'm on the add side, then I tend to run around and hit inside out forehands, which, which I really like a lot. So I, I don't really have a huge preference when it comes yeah. to that. Yeah, I think that's one thing that um, I, I think it might be slightly different. I, I talked um, in in my interview a few weeks ago with uh, Gabby Dabrowski. We talked about this, and um, I, I think at y'all's level of tennis, the the backhands aren't like nearly as big of a liability as they are at like my like club league level of tennis. Um, so, so what I tell a lot of uh, my readers and audiences is, is to use the I formation on the ad side a little more because that net player will have a forehand volley in the middle, which is a lot stronger because mm-hmm. um, so many club and rec players just don't have very good backhand volleys. Um, right. So it's a way to kind of hide that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so earlier you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Jamie Murray. He, he has, uh, I think he said the worst forehand you've ever seen. Um, <laughs> What do you consider uh, your biggest weaknesses on the court? Well, let me rephrase his. He's, I think he has the worst <laughs> forehand I've ever seen from someone who's become number one in the world. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> so I need to give him a lot of credit on that. Um, <laughs> but my weaknesses, um, I, think I've, I think I've struggled on the return at times, you know, especially yeah. – especially, when um when players are serving well um and i think that's something i've been trying to work you know it doesn't come as naturally to me um the mm-hmm. return as maybe the serve does and um and i think the mental aspect you know i think every day is different and uh, girls can be a little bit moody sometimes and sometimes it's uh, some days are more difficult than others so i've definitely um struggle with that in the past but I think that's something that you know all players do and you know you need to work on yourself so mm-hmm. I think this the psychology aspect as well okay what, what have you done to work on uh, those two things um well for the returns I just try and you know um whoever I'm practicing with just you know to ask them to serve to me and just yeah. uh, work and work and work on returns as much as I can um and then uh, the psychology part, like during quarantine, I was doing a lot of meditating um, mm-hmm. and different visualization exercises and stuff. So I'm I'm hoping that um, it probably, you know, it doesn't happen overnight, but I hope if I can get into like a consistent routine, maybe that can make a difference um, in my career going forward. And also one thing I've learned, especially from playing with Krita, um the last couple of years she's so chilled on the court and when she loses a match it's like she she lost a match like okay and if she wins a match she wins a match okay great you know she doesn't she doesn't give things too much attention whether it's good or bad and I feel that's rubbed off a little bit on me that I'm not obviously if I win a tournament I'm thrilled I'm excited Mm -hmm. but you know I know that there's another tournament the next week so I can't really um you don't keep thinking of, Oh, I want a tournament and yeah. you know, weeks go by. So you always have a job to do the next day, but then same thing when you lose a match, guess what? You're playing on Monday next week again. Right. <laughs> so it's, I think the cycle of just not taking things overly serious. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like, um, I, it's almost embarrassing that I haven't read it before now, but I just started, uh, the inner game of tennis last week. 
Um, and uh, he talks about that a lot, it's at least the part I've gone through so far about like seeing things for what they are rather than like judging them and like getting, I don't know, worked up about losing or winning a match. You just kind of like just see it for what it is and don't like say it's good or bad and things like mm-hmm. that. I think that's super helpful in the court. Yeah. Um, do you, what do you use for meditation? Do you use any apps like Headspace or Calm or anything um, like that? The, the or one it... I've been using is Balance. Okay. So I've liked that, but also, like I said, the WTA was sending out um, WTA um, guided meditation as well. Nice. Um, cool. Yeah. Um, so let's see, I had a couple other. So how do you, um, you said you've been playing with uh, the same partner for, for how long? Well, I played with Krita Pishke in 2018 and 19. And then from the mm-hmm. beginning of 2020, I've been playing with, um, the Chinese player Yifan Shu, but she goes okay. by Julie. Okay. Got it. Um, how do you choose a partner? Like how? Uh, yeah, it, it sounds like you've kind of st- stuck with one partner for a few years and then now you've got another one. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And then some players like play with different partners. It seems like every other tournament or something. Yeah. I mean, if you're lower ranked, a lot of times you're struggling to get in and you mm-hmm. maybe might um, link up with a partner for a couple of tournaments, but then maybe you want to play with that partner, but you can't get in. So then you switch at the last minute just so you can get in. So you have a job that week. Mm -hmm. So I think it's difficult for the, um, when I was ranked, you know, outside the top 40, I didn't have a steady partner really because it's just so difficult. But, um, but once you're, if you're willing to like commit and a lot of players, when you have one bad tournament or two bad tournaments, they panic and all of a sudden they, think something is wrong and then they Mm -hmm. want to switch partners because everyone seems to be looking for something better but the important part in a partnership is that you're supposed to learn together and grow together and so um Kveta gave me the opportunity back in 2018 to play with her because she was much higher ranked than I was at the time and I I think I um I think I did it I learned a lot from her and did a good job to raise my level to where she was at Um, but yeah, basically we just, we talk in the locker rooms and you get to know the players on tour and you see how they're practicing and you see their work Mm -hmm. ethic and you see their game and they're like, Ooh, if I had, you know, if I had her next to me and she has her lefty serve, then that would be cool for me at the net. Maybe we would match up well. And then if you talk with the players, um, I think everyone knows what style player matches up well with them. And I think those are the players that you um, target and want to, you know, try and ask and see if they want to play with um, you as well. Mm-hmm. What, what style is best for, for your game? Well, um, I think someone that returns well um, definitely helps um, just because, like I said, um, it's uh, it's not the strongest part of my game, but it is improving. So I think if I can have someone that can be be yeah. rock solid with that, and also someone that's very good at the net, because if I if I'm serving well, but you know they're hesitant or they don't like to volley, then it, it's gonna be it's not gonna make my serve look good, right. you know. So I need someone that can compliment me on that. So those are a couple things that I look for in partners. Right. Awesome. Um... So what what about what do things look like for like a pre match um, like going into a match what what do you do to kind of game plan against a specific opponent do you watch a lot of film or look at stats or anything like that um, I do I, I do a bit of that and my co- obviously my coach does uh, does what he can mm-hmm. but I like to do research for myself because I feel like if my coach tells me oh you know, her forehand isn't great, but I feel like I need to see it for myself to understand what he means by, you know, pick on the forehand. Right. So I will either go to a match of theirs if they're playing before me, maybe their match hasn't been played yet. Mm -hmm. And if not, then I try and find some videos and see if I can pick up on any weaknesses or tendencies or something like that. And, um, but also I've played against a lot of players by now. So I, I remember, um, I remember certain things that maybe worked or didn't work, um, in certain matches. Okay. Got it. And then what what about after a match? Do you do any sort of like 
post-match assessment or post-tournament assessment and like look I always and... talk with my coach um after the match and after mm-hmm. the tournament and do an evaluation based on like how how I played how I felt um what the opponents did what I did well what I could have done better um all of that so we we talk after every match but then we try and talk after the tournament as well because um you because there's the match picture and then the, there's sure. an overall big picture right what what does that look like? Do you all have like a structure or framework for that? Or is it just kind of a natural, like, here's how I felt kind of conversation? Um, we, we have a conversation, but we'll also even sit down and watch, maybe rewatch the match and go over some things mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Um, so next I want to get into just some routines. So what, uh, let's talk about practice first. So what does a typical practice look like for you? Um, how's it kind of scheduled? Um, well, I normally, um, arrive 30 minutes before my practice so I can warm up cause I want to make sure my body is warm and, you know, I'm ready to, ready to go from, from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, I already have 20 or 30 minutes of, you know, moving my body before. Um, but pra- all practices what, what are the, different. What, what's the warm up look like? Sorry. Um, I usually start on the floor and I'll, fo- I'll like roll a bit either on like a peanut or on a foam roll and, you know, loosen up some tight muscles, but then, you know, I'll jog, I'll do a dynamic, um, I'll do some di- active dynamic stretches. Okay. Um, I'll do band work, um, to make sure, you know, my shoulders and wrists are warmed up. I might throw a medicine ball. I, I maybe do some like quick feet or shadow swings. It, it depends mm-hmm. on the temperature, you know, obviously if it's really hot, then yeah. my b- b- blood is probably flowing already. So right. I don't need to jog, you know, 10 times around the court, but if it's cold, then, you know, it might right. take a little longer, but just making sure um, the blood is f- flowing and that, you know, my back, my hips, my, uh, my shoulders, everything is just mm-hmm. feeling like if I needed to play points um, r- right away, just warm up for five minutes and play points that my body would be ready. That's, sure. that's the standard I try and go by. Okay. But yeah, practices are different. It depends. Um, some days, you know, I'll do maybe a lot of feeding because I want to work on things. Um, maybe a little bit of technique or some rhythm, um, or just get a lot of repetitions in and feeding feels good. Sometimes I'll do a lot of live ball just to make it more realistic. Some days, we'll play points, um, point situations. If there are certain scenario, um, strategies on the court that you want to work on, then maybe you do the, the exact like strategies, um, over and over. And then there's match play or set play that we do. So, Mm -hmm. you know, you go and just, you know, play a set against another team and, and, uh, talk with the coach in between points and try and figure it out. So those are different ways in which I can practice, and um, this week, because World Team Tennis still isn't for another couple of weeks, so I'm still trying to – I'm playing points. Um, I even played a set today. But uh, overall, like, I feel like because of quarantine and stuff, I feel like I'm still, you know, working on trying to find a rhythm and trying to feel yeah. my shots again and get used to the heat and moving and stuff. So I'm, I'm just, like, building my way into that um, point right. competitiveness. So is the set today – is that a double set or do you play singles or? Um, I played some singles points today. Yeah. Okay. Got it. <laughs> yeah. Just um, singles helps doubles, doubles help single help singles. Sure. I played doubles points as well. Um, right. But yeah, I, I, I do both because both have benefits for, for mm-hmm. the other. What, what are some of your favorite uh, or what drills, I guess, feeding drills or live ball drills do you find most helpful? For doubles, um, oof. <laughs> there's so many. I think uh, one doubles drill that I like is you know just to, you and whoever you're hitting with both up at the net and doing reflex volleys. I think you know any doubles player can always um, yeah. benefit from that. Um, I really like working on serves and returns because the way you start the point, especially in doubles, dictates a lot of times um, how the way in which the point can go if you're either in control or if you're defending. So right. um, for singles or for doubles, I think practicing serves and returns is really important. Right. Yeah. That's something uh, 
I've personally changed about my, I don't practice very often anymore. I usually just play matches, but uh, when I do, I, I used to a lot of practices, not even hit a serve. Um, mm. And I wish I knew this stuff like in college, but you know, I found out now. Um, and in, like the past year and a half or so, if I go out and practice just for like an hour, I'll spend like at least 20 or 30 minutes just serving and returning, mm-hmm. you know? Um, yeah. Cause it's just such a big part um, of the game. And I think like the, uh, I've had uh, Craig O'Shaughnessy on before. Mm-hmm. Um, who's the big like stats guy. And he's, his big thing is like the number one or the most common thing that happens in tennis is a missed return. Right. So it's yeah. like, like that's the most common point. I think 30% or something of all points oh, wow. are just a serve in and that's it. And mm-hmm. it doesn't come back. So um, yeah, that's a, that's a huge part for sure. Um, so what about a, like a pre-match routine? Do you have like, what is like, let's say it's match day and you play or playing at like, I don't know, like four o'clock or something like that. What What is mm-hmm. the, walk us like through what the day looks like. Well, if I'm playing in the afternoon, then I'll decide if I want to um, practice in the morning, maybe for 30 minutes and then go mm-hmm. and warm up for my match before my four o'clock match. Or if I maybe just want to do a warm up. I think that just depends on how I feel I'm playing. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I would, I would, I would get up, eat breakfast. Um, I would definitely, regardless if I have a practice in the morning or not, I would definitely do some foam rolling and and some exercises to get my body going because I don't want to wait until the afternoon to to get my blood flowing. Um, but if I don't practice in the morning, I would eat lunch maybe around. Um, it would depend. Maybe I would go warm up for my match around one, eat at two to then, you know, have the two hours later uh, to go play at four. Or I would do it the other way. I would eat an earlier lunch, um, maybe at 12. So then, um, so then, or one, and then I can go practice at three o'clock and then, you know, be pretty warm and, you know, just go and change and then go for the match. So there's a lot of different scenarios. I think it depends on court availability. Mm -hmm. um as well um yeah because sometimes also you like to warm up on the court that you're playing on because the practice courts occasionally are different than the match courts so if i'm the first if i'm the first match at four o'clock you know i'll go warm up um at 2 30 on my match court from 2 30 to 3 I have that hour to, you know, get dressed and, you know, mix, mix some drinks that I'm going to take on the court, talk to my coach and it's fine. But if maybe on the third match, I need to go on the practice court, then maybe, maybe I warm up a bit earlier and, right. and then take my time. Okay. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. Interesting. And then let's see. Okay. And then what about, um, how long is that practice the day of a match? Like if you're playing in the afternoon, how long is that morning practice? Uh, again, it depends on how I'm feeling. Usually I would just yeah. do maybe 30 minutes. Uh, so it's kind of like, it's a short practice, maybe a warm up, okay. but occasionally I'll do an hour if the weather is good and I don't feel like I'm getting tired and there's something I want to work on. I might practice for an hour. Okay. Got it. So the goal of that's mostly just to like get your body kind of loose and warm so that you can come out ready i guess well that would be the goal of a warm-up just to make sure you know okay i've hit a few shots here they're going in yeah i feel good and it's fine but the goal of the practice would maybe be to you know if there's something specific that i'm working on in my own game or something specific that i want to do in the match that's coming up maybe i'll try and get a few extra repetitions just to make sure that you know i'm 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 feeling good on it and that it and that it's working Sure. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. And what about like, how do your practices vary from like during a tournament versus like, if you have like a few weeks off, what what does that kind of difference look like? I feel like during a tournament is more just, um, fine tuning and 
feeling mm -hmm. good. It's a lot of warm ups and maybe you work on stuff here and there, but you know, you don't want to be on the practice court too long because you, you know, you don't want to be tired, especially if you're going deep in the tournament. Whereas if I have three weeks off, you know, I'm probably going to work hard to improve for maybe the first two weeks. So maybe even increase the load in fitness and more hours on the court and then slowly taper down during that last week to, um, to, to feel fresh and ready to go for when I do get to the tournament. Got it. Okay. So what's an example of something in the past that you've used that time for? Like, is it like, okay, during these three weeks, we're going to work on returning and we're going to hit a thousand returns a day or something like that for two weeks or. Yeah, that's definitely something. Um, maybe that's a great example between uh, clay court season, grass court season, because sometimes, mm, you know, yeah. um, if, if you don't make the second week of the French Open and you choose to take maybe the first week on the grass off and then just play two warm up tournaments instead of three, then you might have two weeks to practice. So it might be like, hey, you know what? Grass is very different. So let's let's spend a lot of time on, you know, staying low. So working out in the gym, doing a lot of lunges just to make sure your legs are prepared for the grass. But then mm -hmm. going out and practicing maybe things um, uh, that work well on the grass, which is, you know, staying lower on the returns, obviously shorter backswing. Um, sure. You might stand um, a bit closer to the baseline. Um, just certain things. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. It, what's your favorite surface? Is it grass? Grass. <laughs> grass. Yeah. yeah. yeah I think, well, like I'm not twice, sure if it's my favorite surface or that I just like it cause it's my most successful surface. Oh, it can be the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes one follows the other. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So I want to get into just a few rapid fire questions and then we'll hop off. Um, what is your favorite, uh, tennis book? Favorite tennis? If you've read a lot of tennis book. books, maybe you haven't. Um, I have read a few. Um, I did like Agassiz's book a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Winning Ugly by um, Brad Gilbert was a good one. Um, Locker Room Power uh, by Dave Samuel. Okay. Um, that was that was a very good one, and I'm probably gonna read it again. I think he, I even had like my highlighter and was making a lot of points because I think that book is very accurate and just very good for the mind. Um, so if you haven't read that one, it's not. I don't think it's uh, very famous. I'm not sure how famous he got it, but it was um, a coach that was helping me when I was playing a little bit with Anna Smith, a British player. And um, he gave me his book, and it's actually very good. Yeah, actually, I have a copy of it, and I have not read it yet. I um, definitely read it. Yeah, I chatted with him like a month or so ago about. Uh, I think it was about marketing his, helping market his book. Um, mm -hmm. So he sent me a copy, and I still haven't had a chance to read it. But I no read I it. Definitely it's, do that. It's worth it. Yeah. What's What's your favorite uh, non tennis book? I mean, I've always loved the Harry Potter series, <laughs> even okay. as an adult. Um, uh, those are great books, but I don't actually read a whole lot um, mm -hmm. just because I'm still doing uh, school. I do online university. So okay, yeah. uh, maybe when I'm done with that, I've been doing that since 2013. Maybe when I'm done with that, I'll read a little bit more. <laughs> nice. What's, uh, so is it, um, what school are you, are you attending or? Uh, Indiana University work? East. Okay, so that's the thing that's set up with the WTA. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. Got it. And what? Or do you choose a major for that? Yeah, I'm a communications major. Okay, awesome. My uh, my brother just graduated with a communications major. Oh, good. Um. Okay, so what's your uh, favorite tournament? Wimbledon. Wimbledon. <laughs> Why? <laughs> best memories it's just the best yeah <laughs> yes um what is your favorite uh pre-match meal um probably just like a gluten-free pasta with um maybe pesto and a little bit of chicken okay and what last question what is a a tennis story you've never told anyone Hmm. I don't think I have a story that I've never told anyone. <laughs> um, 
Couldn't Not tell sure. you really, but I do have a funny story if you want to hear one. All right, a funny story. Let's so, um, the first Wimbledon I w ever won a match in was the 2017 Wimbledon, um, and mm -hmm. my first match uh, was a mixed doubles match that I won, and it was on court one um, because we were playing against British wild cards against Laura Robson and Dom Inglot, and so we were a, t a TBA match, and then court one opened up early so we got to go play on court one which was awesome mm -hmm. but I'm hunting to try and find a mixed partner and you know I'm like getting numbers for every guy in the draw and writing everyone everyone's already set Wait, how long before the tournament is this this is like two days before the entry deadline for mixed doubles okay so I'm really like <laughs> time yeah. crunching and I write so this guy qualified and you just have to like find a partner no I need to make sure someone's ranking is high points. enough to get oh, in I with see. me I so see. my okay. options are limited but i write this guy andre begeman a german guy i'm like mm -hmm. hey you want to play he's like sure yeah. <laughs> i've never seen him in my life never talked to him nothing <laughs> and uh before our first match i'm like do you want to warm up sure <laughs> so he shows up like 10 minutes late to the practice court <laughs> And I'm like, oh God. And I don't think he even warmed up for practice. So like, and so we hit yeah. and then we go, we play our match, we win. And he's like, oh, you're not bad. Like, you know, maybe we can win another match. <laughs> <laughs> so the next day we have an, or the next day we have a match. He shows up almost on time. He was maybe like two minutes late. Mm -hmm. And uh, we go and we beat uh, Casey Delacqua and Rajiv Ram, and they were uh, one of the seeded teams, and we beat them 15-13 in the third set. Oh, wow. And it was the last match of the day because it was already getting dark. They were thinking of suspending us till the next mm -hmm. day. And then, before, obviously, next time we play, it's his birthday. And <laughs> guess what? He even shows up a couple minutes early to warm up this time. Wow. So we go, we play, we win again, our third round match. It was his birthday, so he was all excited and happy. And we go for our quarterfinal match, and he's walking to the court on time, and he's actually coming from the gym. <laughs> so every time he improved, and then we lost in the quarterfinal. It's a close match, oh, but man. I thought that was you hilarious. Kept, how kept showing up late. It sounded like that was working. <laughs> yeah, maybe, but every day he was improving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Uh, that's awesome. Um, cool. Well, uh, Nicole, thanks for hopping on. Um, I appreciate it. And we'll, we'll have to do it again sometime for sure. Yeah, sounds good. It was, it was nice. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And best of luck with the uh, rest of the season. Thank you, if it happens. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a doubles player, you'll love our weekly doubles newsletter. Every Thursday, we send you doubles tips and strategies to help you improve your game and become a smarter player. When you sign up, you'll get a free 10-page guide on how to play with more confidence and dominate at the net in doubles. You can go to thetennistribe.com to sign up now.